again, a trend, I don't necessarily agree with it, but, but I think that's where we are from an optimization perspective. Yeah, I, I think we need to be careful here because, uh, and I've heard this, a lot of people refer you know, to the wonders of the gig economy and the flexibilities. What, they've, what they fail to continue the conversation to discuss is what happens to the safety nets, uh, the, the social contract elements uh, that have been traditional since World War II between employer and employee, i.e. the uh, uh, supply or um, uh, support of uh, medical services and ongoing education. And, and we forget that those are important elements in supporting a workforce. And if we're going to hollow out that uh, group of benefits uh, that are so critical in, in uh, supporting the economy and our labor force, um, then where does that put us in five years or 10 years with the workforce that doesn't have perhaps the kinds of health care and support that they need and ongoing uh, uh, employer contracts? Interesting uh, note there as well. Uh, there are a number of countries, and I believe even the United Nations is studying what happens at some point in the future on a long enough timeline, you get to a point where RPA replaces the majority of humans, right? As, as a thought exercise. What do you do from an economic perspective in taking care of your citizens when that occurs? You may have a fairly high GDP. Everything's optimized from a country perspective. How do you care for your people and your citizens in that environment? Well, I, I would say we're there. It's not waiting for we're, it to happen. Yeah, it's happening fast. Well, exactly. So the pandemic accelerated a huge number of things. And I think there's all these aha moments. And that is certainly one of them. This whole notion of robotic process automation, I think, is coming to the forefront. I agree with you. I'm, I'm going to change gears a little bit here. I, I, I want to take advantage of the experience we have with data in the workplace and the fact that we have a, quite a bit of practitioners here. I'm curious um, whether you have a, a thought, I know you're working with this, both James and um, Rob. Um, what are some key, what, what, what performance indicators should be measured right now that are useful for determining the workplace when people return? Yeah. Um. What's that magic bullet? Just lay it on us right now. Just solve yeah. all our problems so we let can. Me, <laughs> let me step into that one, Rob. <laughs> and then you can, Thank you. you can step in after. Thank you. I think, uh, again, human centric, it's people and it's technology right now, not necessarily space, right? Our, so, from a C suite perspective, from a shareholder or corporate perspective, how's it going? Are my teams communicating? Are they collaborating? Are they doing the things they need to do? How do I know that? What does best look like? What does good look like? How do we replicate that across the teams? What technologies are we using now because we had to? And which one of those are working best? And how do we deploy that moving forward from an optimization perspective? So I think from that perspective, there's data sets that we can look at. Microsoft made an error, but, but it was a really good first try. Uh, when they come out with Teams Analytics and they, they showed you all kinds of stats around how you're working, who you're talking to, where they made the mistake is they went all the way down to the individual level and they said, oh, James sent eight emails today. Well, what's wrong, James? How come you didn't send 12? Well, that, that's never something we should do, right? So when we think about democratization of data and measuring things, what we should be doing is communicating to everybody why we're measuring it. Right? And I think that goes back to your point that also answers maybe one of the potential questions coming up is how do we ensure that people don't feel like they're being spied on or that they're accepting of the mm -hmm. metric? So let's all get agreement and buy-in. This is what we're measuring. This is why we're measuring it. That's why it's a key performance indicator. And in fact, as we're producing and giving to this KPI, you should be able to see the needle move individually down to your level or maybe your team persona or maybe your business unit. And that becomes a definition of how you define the dashboards and the KPIs. So that being said, I think there are some things we can do in HR that align to that as well. Uh, but I'm going to leave that sort of open to Rob. And James brings up a lot of really, really good points with that. And um, for instance, with network analysis, you can get down to the individual level. And if you see that somebody has only sent eight emails versus 12, 
don't go over and tap them on the shoulder and say, what's going on? That uh, that will be very counterproductive. So it's also a bit of a challenge of what level do we prescribe any sort of intervention at? And if you can keep it more high level, I think as James was talking to and really uh, roll that out team wide, business unit wide, that you will see it trickle out to all of the individuals. But uh, there might be something along the lines of if you are doing network analysis, if you see that there is a change in the valence of somebody's participation or a group's participation, just um, be aware of it, but also don't uh, do anything at the individual level. But if you see it seems like somebody is not communicating as often as they used to, um, just be aware of it, but also be very careful how you prescribe any sort of intervention and make sure that it's not a shoulder tap. It needs to be at a much uh, more aggregated level. And it, so, tie on I'm to sorry. That, what might be interesting when you look at organizational network analysis, you know, now that we can pull information from Zoom and the calendar, emails, Teams, Slack, and we can see who's talking to who, you can keep it at a, just a role level or even a department level and see how the departments are collaborating. And I think from a workplace facility manager, workplace strategist perspective, how they might find that interesting is keeping a pulse on that as we are working fully remote right now, as we start to transition hybrid, and then as more people are back in the office, how does that play out into workspace planning scenarios going forward? What teams really do need to sit next to one another beyond what they might just say and maybe some biases that they might have, but, oh, if I have this department in this part of the building and they're on another floor from this other department, that helps you monitor, right? If they can, um, how they're communicating and if you see that they are siloed but you want them to co-collectively create and ideate how do you pull them together in that built environment and i don't know if you guys have any insights on how you might even be able to foster that in a hybrid or remote environment i know rob you've got a lot of experience working from home do you have mm -hmm. any yeah yes and if i wander too far off the point Please bring me back because uh, what you said brought up some um, some ideas. And what's really interesting is if you ask somebody's manager. So let's let's do a survey. That's what I do. Uh, let's do a survey and get information from somebody's manager on if they need to be in the workplace. But then let's ask the person if they feel they need to be in the workplace you will probably see uh, quite a, a difference um, amongst some groups where a manager would say, I absolutely need my team of 10 in the office five days a week. And then within that team, you may see we've been doing fine for the last year. Uh, we've been using the technology. We have um, ways of communicating that we get those ideas shared. We are hitting all of our deadlines. We're as productive as we always are. And it's, it's that disconnect as well. So it's really interesting to get the perspective of the management and who they feel needs to be in the office versus the individuals and the experiences they're having. But with that said, there are some groups that I do feel uh, would benefit a lot from being in the same physical space. So uh, again, I think it comes back to communication and let's, uh, let's see who feels comfortable in the office, who feels comfortable working remotely, and then we can kind of build up those conversations from there. You know, as a, as, as a follow-up to that, and I, I've seen a few uh, pop-ups uh, in the chat, I'd like to address some of that. Uh, maybe the best way is an example, right, uh, that we all can understand. So we have customer service, we have sales, and we have product development. If I look at the communication patterns between those three personas, I might find that customer service is not having any or very little communication with product development. And from an HR perspective or from a corporate perspective, I look at that and go, that, that doesn't make any sense. If you don't know what's going on in, from a usability perspective on your product and you haven't closed that loop with product development, how are you optimizing product development? Right? And maybe they think they're doing some really cool things with pragmatic marketing and they got all the information, but 
anyway, they still should have a closed loop. So from an HR perspective, you would put together an initiative to help create communication and team building between those two personas, right? And what comes out of that might be new tools for sales. So that's part of the collaboration and innovation processes that we can look at. Now, that being said, I saw some great things come through from chat. What about privacy? What about people feeling like they're being spied on? What about the unions? Um, wow, you know, that, there's a lot to unpack there. But here's what I would say. If you approach data analytics to a human-centric level and try to measure productivity or use it in some form related to comparing person A to person B, and then from a promotion perspective or anything like that, it will absolutely fail. That is, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is working anywhere, hybrid environment, doesn't matter where your workplace is, whether it's at home, in a coffee shop, what does your work look like at your persona level? Is it working and what does best look like? So if best looks like this and you're not doing that, that's okay, but let's, let's give you some insight into that. Maybe there's some things that's happening in these best teams that your team might be able to implement. And to be fair, the best practice over here may not fit over there. It's an entirely different team, but we should be looking at it. From a C-suite perspective, we should be looking at which handles we're pulling on, what initiatives we wanna have, what projects we wanna have in order to move uh, our, the growth of our company. And, and that's the hard part, right? It used to be real estate, the building, it was easy to understand. Reduce my energy, reduce my, my corporate footprint. What's my utilization rate? It, I just had to have it, right? At C-suite, I understand I got to pay a bunch of money, salaries, then, then building, sometimes building, then salaries. That kind of sucks, but it happens. They don't, that's not part of the conversation anymore. It's my teams are doing stuff to move the company forward for shareholder equity. Do they have the right tools and things to make that happen? So now the conversation's entirely changed. You've got to put yourself in a corporate initiatives, KPI metrics conversation, and then start talking about this is what workplace looks like for you from a workplace strategy perspective. I think that's going to be a huge shift and a hard one for our industry to have, but I do think that's what's happening because that drives what you're measuring. It drives the data that you're looking at because you have to measure it, and it drives what your initiatives are to help move the company forward. And it starts to potentially, call me out anybody here, you're going to keep the logo. <laughs> To, to bring, as a lot of people are talking about right now, HR, IT, legal, theory, FM, together, and working more holistically, collaboratively than potentially in the past in the silos. And now you're bringing all this information together to help, because I think you have a good point. It's really to help leverage the employee and give them what they need to do their best work. And some of through this year, we see an engagement go up when no, those numbers have been stagnated for decades. And I'm gonna throw this to Ethan. I may be on point, I may not be. So <laughs> let me know if I'm not, but I'm curious from, from the wealth perspective, do you have any, any thoughts on, on this and engagement and providing employees the tools that they need to do their best? Well, I think James is, is onto something that we're trying to wrap our heads around ourselves is that is productivity the key performance indicator that we need to, to look at? And I'd say a lot of us are, are saying, no, it's far more nuanced than that. It's, it's, it's more of this focus of understanding um, those individualized and customizable components that work for your workforce. That would, like, how, do you, how do you craft pathways for developing um, the, the necessary thought processes for understanding those linkages without, um, uh, you know, first really diving in and coming up with what those like questionnaires look like uh, ahead of time. That will inform the things that, again, I mean, I, I think I think James and Rob bring a, a, a much better perspective to the technological component of this than I can. But from like the 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 workplace strategy component and potentially redesigning um, the built environment as we know it. I, I don't think that there's any other way to sort of target the experience place where play to, uh, design that many people are, are beginning to tout in terms of how do you make the office more human centric to, uh, I think the question that was posed in the chat a few minutes ago, what does human centric even mean? It's like, well, your organization considered you as the individual or your team as the group of individuals in the way that it is structured and laid out. So 
Um, I think it's going to take a few case studies to really understand, well, what is the more nuanced metric beyond just productivity, absenteeism, presenteeism um, that needs to be evaluated? And I wish I could give you an answer as to what that really looks like in terms of the well framework, but uh, TBD, watch this space, I guess. So Ethan, you know, to be human centric, I mean, uh, so much of it is around our physical being and our locational uh, issues. Let me ask, and maybe Rob, you'll know this, have you worked with any employers or as your own employer look at uh, the spatial relationship between where people live? In other words, have you mapped the knowledge based workforce in your in your uh, uh, to really understand what's the impact of all of these people commuting to the location that I've selected for them? So one one uh, example, and there we have another member of our team, uh, Dr. Angela Loda, who leads our research team at the International Well Building Institute who uh, uh, helped administer a survey, right? It was about at the time when our workforce started experimenting with uh, a, ro a remote month. So in the summertime, there was three months and you could choose one month to work remotely. And so we started taking the data through this uh, customized survey. I think it was administered through Cornell, but I could be wrong. Um, and the findings from that have helped indicate you know, the future of how we could ourselves potentially adopt a hybrid approach. Um, that's, that's one example. The, the findings of that and the nuanced uh, details of that uh, could be explained better by Dr. Angela Loder. But um, yeah, I'd be curious what uh, Rob's thoughts are, if maybe there's some other examples of that. Yes, um, as far as the workforce goes, we are able to do some sort of geolocation using address, uh, distance to work, stuff like that. And it's been really interesting because uh, in some instances, some people have to be at work to build things. And um, the supporting cast has a little more flexibility around that, but it's, um, it is a lot of data to take in and we're still working through a lot of it but uh, it has, it's in the crosshairs. <laughs> I'll, I'll add to, to uh, the, the point about some of our survey findings was that it wasn't necessarily the existence of remote work that was, was deemed a favorable um, uh, component, but that there, the choice existed. And so choice is a key word, I guess, in, in how we're looking, look, looking forward to understanding what um, these potential pre-occupancy, post-occupancy surveys can be structured so that um, you know, again, looking beyond just productivity, what is what is expectation? What is choice? How does that one, work? One of the uh, specific methodologies we've been putting forth is to map the labor economy, uh, the geo mapping uh, process, by looking at the um, occupational codes and uh, jobs uh, classifications of people, and uh, using that along with a clustering approach to find out where we can get those economies of scale and really kind of create uh, coincidence of communities uh, in more local areas. So uh, I don't know if that's something, Rob, that you, you, you know, you've looked at, but we, we were actively trying to seek others participants to consider how we might start mapping the knowledge-based economy as a starting point to be more human centric. Yes, very interesting, and it's uh, very um, temporal. As um, I was perusing the internet today, there's a blogger that I follow, and uh, she was actually looking at HR data clustering and geolocation. So uh, definitely going to be reading more about that, and I'm not sure if it's being done elsewhere in the business, but it, it feels like it's something that we should be doing if we're not currently doing it. So um, yeah, definitely going to explore that more. Rob, if you could put that link down to the blog in the in the chat, if you can grab it, that would be great. I'd love to, to look. Sure. At it. Yeah. There are a couple you know, other concepts that I, I really wanted to to touch back on um, that I just heard. Choice. I believe Ethan had mentioned choice, and I think choice is a key tenant. It should be uh, for moving forward in the return to office, or even currently work from home, or work from whatever works best for you. The um, other thing I will say is uh, we talked about bringing HR, bringing IT, um, bringing um, the business units. Clearly, they're usually the ones dictating what we do in the workplace to the table. I'm going to suggest that we bring the employee in as many as possible and explore that possible disconnect between management and the floor. And we, we honestly, we take an honest look at our economy today, which is no longer 
driven by the second industrial revolution and is predominantly made up of knowledge workers and their backgrounds and their expertise is the assets that really produce value for the company. And those backgrounds and expertise operate in different ways from individual to individual. So that's that kind of adds to the complexity James was talking about, uh, the C-suite needs to understand about how value is being created and how do you support them it isn't something that's cookie cutter. So I kind of wanted to put those concepts out and see, James, do you think, do you, do you think that, um, do, would you agree? Or do you want to deliver the people's elbow for the first time in a couple of weeks? Yeah. I, no, I, I, I completely agree. And, you know, kind of going back to that entire conversation, I think, I think COVID had a knee jerk reaction to certain things, right? So we allowed people to move wherever they felt comfortable because you're working from home anyway. Why can't home be anywhere? And they move to a place where they felt more comfortable and they're able to produce work. That's in the US and in certain other select countries. When you think of it from a globalization perspective and you apply all the environmental thinking and, and why cities are good for the human species, particularly smart cities and what that means, I think that'll be a, there'll be a contraction. We, we have to, as a species, collect and coalesce into compact spaces, if you will. Uh, and that's where smart cities come from and, and hybrid work environments and live where you work and play and all that good stuff. And those are all excellent trends. And I think we'll, that we'll eventually get there. But right now, this is where we are. And it absolutely goes to your point. If we're going to keep people happy and productive, we have to give them a choice, right? And there's notions about, you know, having the vaccine passport and can an employer force and mandate a vaccination to employees. And what I read just recently on LinkedIn uh, in the U.S., that is absolutely legal to mandate vaccinations from an employer perspective to an employee if you want to maintain your employment status. Again, don't agree with it necessarily. It's just a fact that's been observed. The, you know, the, it's it 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 becomes a little frightening. I mean, everything in, the, in what we considered you know sacred uh, to us is is now turned upside down. The one thing that that we can provide to offer a sense of comfort to help find what the new normal is, is to offer acceptable choices for everyone. So 100% on board. What works best for you, great, that's the choice you wanna make. I do think over time, when we start benchmarking, we start showing what good, what best is, giving you the choice to determine if you want to align to that or not, could be very beneficial as well. I wanna, I wanna add on to that too and go back to something Jamal uh, uh, asked about earlier with uh, the, idea, the idea of community and what this change has, has meant in terms of the reevaluation of what's going on around us. And uh, forgive me if this is like too uh, uh, tangential or, or, or whatever, but um, I, I think it really can't be ignored uh, just how this great shift has brought us closer to nature in so many ways. And so when we have this conversation, I know this is focused entirely on technology, but I don't think it can be ignored that, I mean, I, I live in Queens, so it's pretty noisy and urban, but I've become a like pseudo ornithologist over the past year. I know several people have like picked up new ways to bring uh, uh, the nature around them, their landscape, or even move out to places where they can be surrounded by these environments. And um, what you, whatever you may say about what those great migrations look like from the technology component is one thing, but I don't think we can even consider this hybrid approach or return to a workplace without thinking, how do you bring that expectation and new, potentially even new passion and love for the biophilia, uh, you know, psycho uh, response to your uh, natural environment into just whatever you do now? So I, I love the comment that just popped up while you were talking, Ethan. Uh, you know, how do we move from buzzwords to reality and what's the analytics behind that? There's a new term of the day, it's bio -digitary. So it's, it's bio and, and, and uh, a number of other words put together, but ultimately it's how do we emulate and support the effect of nature indoors with the use of technology? So we can do that with the use of sound and potential sensors related to sound and some visuals and there's analytics related to that. Analytics are again, very human centric analytics. Do you feel more relaxed and there's key indicators from facial expressions that you can get from that. These are typically research studies that are done for individuals within spaces or zones within a, an office that have been supported by nature, including the digital element of the supports of nature where they've, been, uh, they've increased their focus levels, they've increased productivity, they've increased cognitive capability, cognition, if you will, remembrance, uh, keyword remembrance, things of that nature. 
in those spaces. So there is the ability to, from a research perspective to prove that these things have a positive impact. What we were starting to do prior to the pandemic was exploring with zones and just speaking in general, globally, right? So as an industry, we were looking at, at biophilia in the workplace, potentially within areas of relaxation or zones. Healthcare is a great thing. They had these little biophilia rooms you can go in, relax. Everybody felt more relaxed. You can get back and it helped out with, with worker burnout. I am hopeful in our pilot programs moving forward globally, that all of us are looking at including at least some level of zones related to biophilia for health and wellness and relaxation. And then I hope you're exploring ways to include technology as a support mechanism for that. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. In fact, in a built environment, it's very important to do both, to have that level of support in those spaces. James, I, you know, you guys are, you guys are awesome. First off, thank you for attending and for contributing to the community. I'm going to open, I, I, as the self-imposed mayor of the community, will invite you to join any time you like to or have, are free to. Um, and I think you would have really dug the um, segment we did on biophilia. Mr. Gray, would you, would you mind gracing us with your presence and maybe tell us a little bit about that and let us hear your voice, at least in this session. Jamal, thank you. I apologize for being about 40 minutes late. I've got a brand new router and I'm ready to go. Um, did we, let me, let me go off book here, Jamal. Did we get into d &I at all, equity? We, we, we did from the perspective of getting everybody involved, those that are out, off site and those that are in site. So that okay, was, little, the, that was little, the approach. Little digital equity, just so uh, just a quick check in for people that you know, there are two exciting uh office deals done recently in Atlanta, uh, Airbnb and uh, Autodesk. And the Autodesk deal, getting back to some comments we heard from our panel 15 minutes ago, uh, said, Hey, we've got less than one percent people of African heritage, and we need to grow our engineering team, I guess in Colorado Springs or in Boston where they both are. And the VP of talent said, well, hold on, let's go get some data and found out that in Atlanta, there's a lot of all black universities that have engineering majors and Florida graduates, Central Florida, about 300 uh, black Americans in engineering a year. So they're having tremendous success using some of that metric analysis, that macro uh, hub and spoke analysis. And I've just wanted to, I know we, a lot of us here know all about that or, or heard uh, Andrea Robb who was in charge of uh, talent at the end of 2019 and put that in play for Autodesk uh, and then work with the real estate to execute it literally within three weeks. So it was pretty powerful and then COVID hit. I think from COVID, a lot of other people are going to look at those macro numbers. So I just wanted to, Jamal, I just wanted to underline that, bold it, maybe tilt it into italics as well. Perfect. You gave us a, a glimpse at the topic of the after party. Um, I want to again take the time to, to thank Rob, um, James, and Ethan for joining us. It's 1 o'clock, 101 now. So if you have to run, we certainly understand. Uh, we invite you to join us next week where we will discuss Mr. Gray. Wow. Next week is is off the hook. Today was uh, the, the launching and I missed the front end. Maybe Eric was here for a bit. And Jamal, I bet you talked about we and now this new hub uh, in Atlanta with the team of uh, Elizabeth and Chris are off to. It's going to be dynamite. The Silicon Valley will be coming in and grabbing great stuff from Atlanta in the future. So that's really cool. Next week, Detroit. Who thought, you know, apparently I thought Detroit was all about, uh, all about music and, that, and that's it. But apparently there's an automotive industry there too. And that was, was kind of a surprise because I know Tesla is, is out here in the West Coast. And I thought that was the automotive industry. So I've learned a lot from talking to the WeHub uh, move plan team there. And we have got an amazing, the, the chief of mobility for the state of Michigan is going to kick us off. Uh, we've got Tesla, Ford, Chevy, uh, the, the motorcycle from Wisconsin that's really loud. 
Harley Davidson. We've got uh, the workplace people from those groups uh, coming in. So next week is going to be uh, uh, a lot of fun. And then there's two books being uh, chewed up uh, with the authors coming in later in March. I don't want to go on and do too many more advertisements on scheduling. But Jamal, great stuff. We have many great things ahead of us. I, I want to welcome each of you here now to the after party. We go for another 30 minutes for the hardcore workplace enthusiast, and we take it to places never before gone. Um, this is usually hosted by my, my colleague, David Gray. And this, you know, I, I will say, because this, a lot of you, it's your first time, uh, the mosh pit has been re relatively quiet as of late. Um, usually we have a great deal of interaction. So I want you to be aware, if you do join us again, it could seem a little, <laughs> whoa, where did that come from? That's the mosh pit. That's how I, we, we typically have it. It's a forum. Everyone gets in, they share their expertise, and that's where we get learning. Um, I will say one more time, one, one more time, I mean, Ethan, Rob, James, you guys have been great. Um, one of the key terms that I took from you today was human-centric. And I think that, James, I think you made the point uh, in the past, it's been about densification. It's been about paying attention to the numbers as it relates to the people. I just believe that that shoots you in the foot a lot of times in regards to productivity and, and what your major cost is in terms of people and what you're doing to their, their um, operate. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox. Thank you so much, the three of you. Thank you. Truly, well, did, I, you I appreciate uh, it. did Anthony Lee plug our... Uh, our March 2 and March 9, uh, learn how to communicate better. He did not. Anthony, thank you for coming off mic. You guys, this, if you haven't ever worked on improving presentations like the, the, the three people doing it in a digital fashion just now were absolutely dynamite. Even they, even um, amazing folks, and those that have never really worked at this skill set before can learn how to communicate truths and get to the four key frequencies from blueprint to knowledge receivers out there. Anthony, with that, what's coming up on March 2 and 9 that is, uh, is so awesome? And could you drop that link in the chat too? Absolutely, David. What we witnessed today was three leaders, Ethan, Rob, I'm missing one more person. James. James. So what worked really well, and this is what I pay attention to, are leaders who can communicate a vision of a future that they're creating. And that doesn't happen by accident. There's a lot of thought, there's a lot of prep work that I know each one of you did before taking the stage here. Oh. So that's the purpose of our two-part workshop is come into the workshop, be able to articulate a vision that gets you supporters, get you funders, get you followers, get you just anyone that can assist in your pursuit of a global impact mission. Uh, I'm very honored to have David and Jamal as two of our facilitators. So you come in, you learn some skills, we put you into what we call a workout room, not a breakout room for you to share this vision and share it in a powerful way. So Look forward to looking, uh, seeing every one of you in our workshop, March 2nd, March 9th in the mornings. I'll put it in the chat. Thanks, David. Yeah, and it's, uh, I know m money's never uh, important, but it's ridiculously inexpensive relative to uh, what you get out of it. It's uh, great. And if you're between things right now, um, it, it hit me up. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got one scholarship to, uh, to share. So send me, uh, uh, a side note, or, or, or just send it directly to Anthony, if uh, if you if you'd like to work on the communication stuff. So Jamal, I think I think that's it for uh, advertisements. And uh, I'm sorry I missed the first uh, uh, 40 minutes, but I could tell it was dynamite because the energy level from those three certainly kept up. Yes, yes, it was. And, and we'd be remiss to not thank um, the leaders of the ATL Hub once more for joining us and for being such a significant contributor to this session. So um, hands and kudos to you, too. Thank you so yeah, much. And, and, and uh, Elizabeth and, and Chris, you know, you, you two are actually the, the leaders of the After Hours, even though you've never done it before. So make sure that you're Yes, you are. And this is unscripted, unplanned, and very, it's, it's crazy that I do stuff like this. I apologize, but 
you two are the official uh, moderators. When you look back, and I'll, so I'm gonna hand it, the mic to you with this uh, rhetorical question. When you look back over this last uh, hour and you had expectations for the panel to hit certain points, uh, it, it felt rich to me that they hit a number of great points. Is there, is there something you would underline uh, either of you or something that you would point to and say, I wish we would have talked more about? First thing that comes to my mind, I'll go with it. That reskilling, retooling. We're talking a lot about knowledge workers. I heard a new term, learning workers. Uh, Chris and I have reskilled and retooled ourselves in the last two years. I don't think it's going away. Uh, Technology is certainly going to be there to help, but as AI comes on board, it's going to keep us needing to elevate those skills and being ready for what's going to, what comes next. There's no longer going to be that 30 year trajectory of just going up the ladder like this anymore. I don't think it will. <laughs> it's so important to get a perspective from multiple sources. Like we're, we're always, focused on just like getting information from, is it, is it the door badge data or is it the email or whatever, whatever your, 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 your go-to source of information is. Like it's, it is nice to know that there's, there's multiple sources we should be looking at and make sure that, because there are executives out there that care about more than just whatever piece of data that's in your, your uh, hand at that moment. So if we can find a better way to measure, you know, what they're looking at and kind of find a common ground, then it's, I think we're all going to be, uh, the best off. Another thing that I found interesting, I, I think Rob had mentioned the various, um, I think he, he kicked off the value network discussion. And I think it's the same for the net, the, the value of the networks, but it's also same for the activity and metrics that are being pulled in. We need to discuss the value of those interactions or the value of that data and collecting it. Um, just because two teams are connecting, it could be used, it could be useless meetings or un unneeded meetings. So I think that's something else that needs to be looked at, not just um, whether they're having it and where they are, because you could put two teams next to each other that really are just wasting a lot of time. Agree. <laughs> but does that step Agree. into the whole idea of micromanaging and spying too much if you now are trying to tell people that they're meeting ineffectively they're meeting too much no i i don't think it's measurement for measurement's sake i think i hope that the data set is being used to derive insights for strategic reasons so as long as you have those strategic reasons agreed mm -hmm. agreed and communicated th then you can have the impact that you're looking for so yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I would hope that we're not saying you guys haven't talked for a long time. So talk, I, I think what they're looking at is, well, I mean, but that could happen, right? I mean, that could be and in, in Microsoft sort of prove the case that you could use the data for that. And, and we're all hopefully in our industry saying, no, God, no, don't do that. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to do something else. And this is why it's important. So I, I think that's part of the, the equation. The other, and, oh, no uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, Jamal brings up an, a really good point where um, I hadn't really been thinking about psychological safety, but uh, there's a couple of, like in the workplace, all right, tell us if you're having useless meetings. And that is just uh, such a very interesting point. And if you have psychological safety in your workplace and you're like, you know what, we meet with this team twice a week, but we don't really need to. This could be handled by ad hoc meetings, or uh, I think we really should be meeting with this team more often, but we're not. And then what does the business do if they actually respond to that and they they have some actionable items around that? It's like, thank you for telling us that. We're going to take that to heart and we're going to do some rearranging of schedules. Please keep that conversation going. Then you're in a really good spot. But if you see the business say, uh, actually, we're just going to ignore what you told us. That is a whole different message and it creates a different experience. So it does, it's all kind of framed around culture and um, 
psychological safety and not to totally derail everything, but that just made me think of it. But yeah, asking those workers for feedback and saying, are you meeting too much or are you not meeting enough? And just let us know and then seeing how the employer reacts. You know what's really interesting? I, my litmus test for human interaction, whether it be a meeting, whether it be a KPI, it, it's, it's fundamental. It's what do I hope that you will say, do, or decide, right? So you brought me to a meeting. You, you invited me. What do you hope I would say, do, or decide? And if, if that's not clear, then maybe I shouldn't be in the meeting. Or if that's not clear, maybe the KPI doesn't align to the strategic goal correctly. But ultimately, I think that's part of it. What do you want me to say, do, or decide? The other thing that I'll, I'll mention, just to Jennifer's point, um, the valued information comes from the workers themselves. So you'll hear from their mouths whether they find the meeting valuable or not. And then it's up to the C-suite and management to make the right decision, um, give them permission, if you will, or empower them to use their time more usefully. Well, you just hope people will do that. Right? I think people get into such a routine that, oh, it's my Tuesday meeting at 10 o'clock and you go and you multitask and while well, you're there, right? I think people forget to, that they do have a voice and they can speak up. Rob, do you see data helping in that, um, helping to guide routine, making a determination whether that routine is valuable or not? I do. And uh, I'll go back to the surveys again. And uh, another point that I wanted to make earlier that I totally forgot about is uh, a lot of people are fearful of survey fatigue. And it's like, did we just survey them? There's not really the issue of survey fatigue. It's lack of action fatigue. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, you can survey people over and over and over again, as long as they're seeing the actionable items come out of that. And uh, it could be like a fairly open survey. Um, with some structure still, but uh, tell us about the meetings that you're having. Do you feel they're productive? What percentage of your meetings are productive? Stuff like that. And uh, you can also have an open-ended question. You know, what questions didn't we ask that you would like us to ask or what other information would you like to provide us with? And then you can hit that with what we call natural language processing so that if you do get 25,000 answers that you can really condense it and get a good message out of that. But uh, you can get a lot of data from it. Just make sure that you're doing something with the data. And I think that the employees will be very receptive to that. that. That ethos is a part of something that we're looking into right now of the bigger question of, is a smart building also a healthy building? And so the data that's being you know, acquired and analyzed uh, over time, is that, is that directly linked towards um, health, health metrics um, on the individual and personable level? And I think I would be curious what, what this group thinks about that main question about smart building, uh, the Venn diagram of a smart building or a smart workplace and a, a healthy workplace. Um, but I, I think that that point about uh, it's not survey fatigue, but a lack of actionable uh, 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 effort fatigue is, is, is such a great point. But I, I think that that is, it, it's just worth considering what implementation looks like over time. and. One thing that we find in the well rating system is the organization, this inherent need for organizational transparency is just such a, a, a foundational element of that. Um, but yeah, I really wanted to pose that one question though in the middle of there. I thought that was a really good point. Rob. Well, show of hands, uh, is, is use your reaction or just raise your hand. Is a smart building a healthy building or are they different? I think a smart building is a healthy building. Otherwise it's not very smart, right? The building should be for us anyway, but that's just Jamal. I was by myself. I'm okay being by myself. <laughs> so, so one informs the other. You, you know, it, 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 I have the curse of knowledge, right? So I'm going to say it depends. So the smart building, the reason that they became smart and intelligent was because we wanted to reduce carbon and save money on electricity, mm -hmm. right? So you can make them really smart and do that. So, so if you follow that logic out, you can make them super efficient by removing the HVAC system, the air conditioning, right? You got to have heat. They just take out the air conditioning. And you can have windows that open. And oh, by the way, that lets fresh air in. And, and that is a smart, human-centric way to do it. But it's not the thing that you should be doing, right? You can, can versus should. So from a smart building perspective, I think it's contextual. I think they can be very beneficial to health and well 
uh, to affording health and wellness of their occupants. I think a vast majority of what we call smart and intelligent buildings, that wasn't in the thinking when they put them together, right? It, and it can be, and it needs to be, and that's part of the things that we have to look at. Important distinctions. I think it's also the perception of the health of the building. Yeah, right. Exactly. You can do all these, we do all these things that are invisible to the employees. Mm -hmm. So you have UV or bio, uh, you know, ionized bio, mm -hmm. bipolar ionization, it's invisible. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, hey, we're doing this thing. We have eight air changes an hour. We're only needing four per code, but how do you show them, right? How do you convey right. that safety? It, that, there's a huge key term there and it's democratization of, democratization of data. It's a huge term because I can't say it. <laughs> but, that's a, but it becomes very important. You have to provide everybody meaningful data sets and how it's impacting their daily lives. Well, that's one of the things that's, that we seem to miss, though, is that those buildings are occupied by people and the impact of that, them going to there has to be part of the calculation of how smart is that building. Yep, hundred percent. If, if if I'm if I'm dragging a thousand people to that building from twenty five miles yeah. apart away every day, that ought to go into the equation of how smart is that? Mm -hmm. Well, in the Isle of Manhattan, right? So how how smart is the Isle of Manhattan with all of those offices and very few places, affordable places to live? Right. So th these are things that we're faced with today that we have to have an answer for. Right. especially for recovery in New York, we, you have to answer that. And I, I think it goes back to changing what a smart city is. Go ahead. I think to Jennifer's point, it's um, with, if she is communicating that with her teams and, and it's spreading out to the country, uh, company, that's building trust in itself, where I think analytics are not trusted. They're deemed manipulative and... Um, mysterious in terms of how they might control people. I think generally people do not trust that. The questions often just seem so um, mundane and, and uh, not really supplying any kind of information. Uh, yes or no, is your room too hot? <laughs> you know, or something like that, or you have too many meetings. Where I think that there has to be a marriage between the analytics and the human factor. Uh, we just cannot uh, replace interaction and teaching and learning how to communicate with each other so that if you don't want somebody meeting so often, maybe you ask them to be more mindful of their time spent in meetings. And prior to doing it, is this something we really need to do today? Is it uh, will we be accomplishing anything? So when I hear, I mean, the whole conversation today was um, just, we're talking about human centric, but it felt like we didn't have any humans in that equation. So to Jamal, yes, I would talk to people. Um, I think we all need to be more balanced in that uh, whole concept of the workplace and how we're going to be moving, what we want to create moving forward. I think that's the power in the term that was the difficult that James just um, enunciated the democratization of information um, is the letting the information put it out there so everyone can use it in a way that best benefits them it's almost expected these days with our smartphones i mean we're looking at data we're taking it in as it applies to us almost by the second looking at traffic conditions looking at the weather looking at um you know the office and, and bookings and things like that so i think that's a huge part of offering choice is a providing data to everyone and not just keeping it in silos within facilities or within workplace or within HR, um, but showing what it is you're collecting, how it can be used and how the user can en en enhance their experience with this data. I think it too is um, different, de different degrees or sizes of um, organizations. It's, I don't think it's gonna be one size or should be one size fits all. I think addressing and acknowledging the uniqueness of every organization and the culture you want to or are um, growing there. I think um, the one size that's all is kind of a all or nothing for the baby out with the bathwater kind of uh, concepts. And I think it's just more um, faceted than that. So 
Well, the one size fits all, I think, definitely got us to 50% utilization across the board as everyone fo followed the same mistake. So I, I definitely agree with you. We have about six minutes, eight minutes left uh, typically, and I want to pass the ball or baton back to our, our host, Chris and Elizabeth, and let us know what, what are some thoughts that you have that you want us to take away, uh, you want to share, or any last questions for anyone here. The other thing that I'd like to do before I do that, though, is give a shout out to Jennifer because she represents the people that never left work. Uh, we keep talking about return to work. We keep talking about working from home and when we get back return. to the office. And there's there are businesses that never left the office. They're like, what, what, we hit, what, we have, what have we been doing this last year? So anyway, hats off, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing your learnings as staying operational through the pandemic. Um, Chris, Elizabeth. What questions do you have for us? Uh, what are things that we hope you hope uh, like our 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 group our kind of uh, our knowledge base it, it takes away from this this uh of event mr o'farrell any thoughts lots where you want to start <laughs> What would you like? Well, I'm curious what you thought about today because you're you're a very seasoned practitioner. The information shared, the thoughts on data um, diversity, and then what would you like to get from the group community moving forward? And just as a warning, not warning, a gentle remind, gentle notification. James, Rob, and Ethan, I will be link linking to you in LinkedIn because I could nerd out with you gentlemen quite a bit longer. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. O'Farrell. You know, uh, <clears throat> one thing that I wanted to, to share was a story that I heard this week. Sorry, I'm losing my voice today. <clears throat> um, about collecting data is a company that I was talking to that have surveyed their employees uh, about return to office and what the criteria were. And when they went out and talked to them as, as individuals, learned that those employees were actually, I don't know how else to put it, lying in the survey. In other words, they wanted to say in the survey what they thought their leaders wanted to hear, but in the actual conversation, uh, it was completely different. And it was <clears throat> to the direction that I think most of us agree we're going, which is we want to go back to the work, but we want to go back to the office. Uh, but they felt like their leadership wanted to hear a more diverse attitude. And I think it's interesting to, to talk about that too, the fact that these survey results, all this data is great. It's very helpful, but I think real human, to what Donna was saying, I, Donna really, I appreciate you coming up uh, with that about the human centric element of this. I think we really have to have a lot of conversations and we really have to take those conversations seriously because what people tell us one-on-one -on -one is often very different from the data that they are willing to fill out uh, in a form. Uh, anyway, I think that's I think that's interesting. The other uh, point, and I think it was Rob who mentioned this, that I thought was really interesting was around, or maybe it, maybe it was you, Jamal. Uh, you know, asking a manager what they think about what their team needs versus what the individuals think. I think the other element of that we need to know is the why. <clears throat> Does that manager want everybody in the office because that's the only way they know how to manage, and they want to see them in their desk? Or is it because they actually believe they're more productive? I, and I think that's a conversation the team has to have. Uh, all of this going back to exactly what Donna said, which is we do have to talk more. We do have to recognize more uh, what, the, what the human element is. The data is great, but it's, it's technically out of context if we're not actually talking to the people. I just see there being a lot more options for choice in the future. And uh, I, nobody's also asking like what's best for each other on the team. Like I, I hear all the time, like it's, I want to be working with my team when I go in the office, but can everybody coordinate their six schedules to be there on Tuesday afternoons? Or mm -hmm. is it going to be like two people trickle in here, two people trickle in there? Like yeah. having somebody having two people in the office on Mondays is not going <laughs> to help me collaborate more with my team. So it's, it's finding those, as it's been brought up here, uh, it's 
finding the right balance for your team and for you know who you are as an individual and where your company stands. And if you can work from home more, like that's probably going to be beneficial for a lot of people, but for not not for everybody. So uh, we'll kind of see how the future holds. Yeah, you know, Chris, I would say um, ev everybody has an idea of what they think it's going to look like in the future, but I think we're going to have a lot of uh, fits and starts in this before we really figure it out. Uh, because even we don't know, we all may say, I, I'm, I'm, I may say I want to go back into the office four days a week and then go do it and then realize that I don't want to do that. <laughs> I think we've got a long way to go. You know, I think I, I said to a couple of friends this morning, although I'm not working, so I'll, I'll admit that right off the bat, I feel like the next two or three years are going to be awesome for people who are in the workplace world, because we're just going to have to keep redoing it over and over as we as we see what works and what doesn't and then go for the next thing. Hopefully we're all super employed and super happy because we're trying to figure out what the future of workplace is. Uh, I just don't think we know. It's my two cents. <laughs> here, here. What a great point. And, you know, in the past, when you wanted to do a change management program from internally, Mike, you know, you, you've had a few thousand employees and a couple hundred when you're handling a real estate and workplace. You, you probably identify like one key champion and say, great, that's my partner. I'll champion this. And that person can handle the rest of the C-suite. Let's go get them. I think now it's, it's going to be a lot of dispersed champions. And I think it's going to get a little bit more complicated because, you know, everyone's going to be waiting to hear, well, is this safe? And should I yeah. really propose that we, we take that extra, that we shut <clears throat> down the Silicon Valley location or cut it uh, in thirds and expand in these other two locations? And so, you know, how's that going to go over politically? I don't know. And so I think a lot of the middle leaders that have been champions in the past, you, there's a lot of steak on the table, a lot of meat, and you're going to need all sorts of creative teams. I think specifically, we're gonna need a lot of scrumming, people from different adjacencies teaming up, you know, engineering talking a lot more than they have in the past, you know, sales Very people. true. Yeah, all that stuff. You said, is this safe? I think to, to Ethan's chagrin, safe uh, from, uh, and maybe James come in and correct me, I'm hoping he will. Um, <laughs> safe to them, I think, has to do with um, liability, whereas safe to the individual employee has to do with health. Um, so mm. I, I think that's, that's kind of an important distinction. The other thing is, as we look for champions for the diversity of work, whether it be in the office or work from home, I'm going to search for a champion for work from home because I've been challenged to ask Mr. Stilson, how much would Lockheed have to pay you in order to get you to work in the office? <laughs> that's classified um sorry no it would be uh, uh it would be a, a large